this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that it's written in our heart and mind to bring forth what you purpose as we hear and do the word of God. We thank you for all that you're going to accomplish through your word in us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of being not deceived. It is important that you and I are not deceived. Who is the adversary? It is the devil. What is he out to do? To steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things he does is he works through deception. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see it's the devil who deceives the whole world. He is the one who tries to deceive us. And he tries, of course, to deceive the church. How does he work? He works through evil spirits that serve him. And these evil spirits that go forth are deceiving spirits. As we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and we certainly are in the latter times, so we know that this is going on now, that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. God wants us to understand the working of evil spirits, deceiving spirits in this day. They're causing people to depart from the true faith of the Lord. And they are bringing forth doctrines of devils. That's why we have such a problem in the body of Christ today with so many teachings. Seducing, deceiving spirits, misleading spirits that want to lead people into error and doctrines of devils. They teach false things, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving to them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing be refused or refu be received with thanksgiving. People that teach these kind of things, of course, are some of the doctrines of the devil and lies that he has brought forth. We must understand that God's word is the truth, and the way that we're not going to be deceived is when we know the word. If we don't know the word, we could be an easy candidate to be deceived. <coughs> Over in John chapter 7, John chapter 7, we see in verse 12, they called Jesus a deceiver. They thought he was deceived. People will think that Christians that are walking in the truth according to the word will also be deceived. It says in John 7, 12, <coughs> there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said he's a good man, others said nay, but he deceiveth the people. They were accusing him of being a deceiver. We see down in verse 46, the officers never spoke, never man spake like this man. They observed that there was something special about this guy. But then said the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, are you also deceived? They called him a deceiver. It is important that you and I get the word of God in us so that we know the truth. If not, you will be an easy candidate for the devil to deceive you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see it says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we receive mercy, we faint not. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. That is an important point. You and I are not to handle the word of God deceitfully. That means we've got to be sure that we're spending the time to study the word, to rightly divide the word of truth so that we know exactly what it says and we are not deceived. If we don't handle the Word of God in a proper way, we will be deceived by the enemy. That's why we've got to look up all the scriptures on a subject and look up what the words mean in Hebrew and the Greek and look up tense, voice, and mood and look up every scripture and not leave any out. That is so important. We cannot follow the traditions of men. We must follow the ways of the Word of God. We know the fact that we must be a pleaser of God. In 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, we see in verse 1, he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance into you, that it was not in vain. For even after we'd suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. In many places in the world, the gospel does go forth with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, it wasn't deceiving, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, 
For, because, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. See, we are put in trust with the gospel. And we've got to speak in line with the truth. Not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. That's an important point. We cannot be pleasing men. We cannot be compromising for what men think. We can't just be teaching things that someone will like and someone won't like. We're going to skip those things because they may, might get offended over that. No. We've got to speak the truth. He says, God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Not that we're a cloak, as it says. That means we're trying to deceive people, greedy, trying to get people to give money and so forth, which is what a lot of people do. Flattering words, trying to speak things. No, we're going to speak the truth of the Word of God, not trying to manipulate people, being Jezebelic. Nor of men sought we glory. We don't ever seek glory of men. All the glory goes to the Lord. Neither of you, nor yet of others, when you might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle unto you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. These people that are harsh and mean and hard, hard on people. This isn't God. God's not working through them whatsoever. We're to be ministering, as he says, being gentle unto them. Being affectionately desirous of you, we are willing to impart it unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Giving forth of ourselves. This is what is supposed to come forth as the gospel is being preached. He says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring day and night, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. The whole counsel of God has to be preached of the gospel of God. He says, your witnesses, God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. We must walk in holiness. We must walk in righteousness. We must be unblameable before the Lord if we are representing him. For you know how we exhort and comfort and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. We're going to teach, we're going to exhort, we're going to comfort, we're going to charge, encourage, build up, tell people the truth and not hold anything back that we would walk worthy of God, who's called us unto his kingdom and glory. See, we've got to walk worthy of him. He's called you to that. You were to enter into it, but we've got to walk worthy of the Lord. For this cause, he says, we thank you without ceasing. When you received the word of God, you, received, you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God's word will work mightily in you as you take hold of it, and you act upon it, you believe it, you do what it says. We cannot be men-pleasers. We must be God-pleasers. We cannot be misleading in any way. We must be walking the walk of the Lord. How does the enemy work to deceive people? That is an important point. Because if we're not to be deceived, we've got to be on guard so the devil cannot work through his spirits of deception. We see, in fact, you must understand, first of all, that in the latter days, as we already saw one scripture about the doctrines of devils and the, the, the seducing, deceiving spirits, we see that deception is the mark of the last days. In Matthew 24, 4, in speaking about the last days, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, nobody. For many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, but they shall deceive many. People saying they're of the Lord, but they're going to end up deceiving people because they're not speaking the truth. He goes on down here in verse 11. He says, For many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. You cannot believe what a person says, I don't care what they say they are, unless it's in line with the word of God. Because iniquity shall abound. This is lawlessness shall increase. The love of many shall wax cold. The deception is going to be great in the last days. In fact, we even see it says there will rise false Christs, Christ, false prophets. They'll show even great signs and wonders. You cannot follow after signs and wonders. You can be deceived. Signs and wonders are not the mark of the gospel. It is the word of God and the fruit in a person's life. You know them by their fruit. They'll grow, grow, show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's an important point for these last days. Signs and wonders will be done by false people. And because people have a tendency to follow after that, they will easily be deceived. And it says that these signs and wonders are going to be great. So you must understand, these aren't going to be minor little things. 
These are going to be great signs and wonders that are going to be awe, awe-inspiring to, towards people that we'll see. It can even deceive the very elect. That's why do not ever follow signs and wonders. Instead, you must keep your eyes upon the Lord. Therefore, we've got to be sure that we're not deceived. Mark chapter 12, over here in verse 24. Jesus said to them, Do you not therefore err? This is the word that's translated deceive often, caused to stray, lead astray, lead away from, lead away from the truth is what deceive means. Anything that will be contrary to the word of God. Do not therefore err or be deceived because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. If you do not know the scriptures, you'll be easily deceived. Remember what happened with Eve? Eve didn't know the scriptures. She didn't have things straight. We know the fact that, what did she say? She said the fact that we couldn't eat of it or touch of it. Well, that's not recorded that you couldn't touch it. It said you couldn't eat of the fruit in Genesis. She was deceived. She didn't have the scriptures straight in her. You must have the scriptures exactly. Precise, correct knowledge of the word of God. You know, the devil knows scripture. We talked about that. We were quoting how, the devil, uh, how we resist temptations and overcome his attacks with the word of God. How the devil can quote scripture. And he can twist things or add things. You've got to know exactly what's being said. You also must know the power of God. You know, we don't know the power of God. We're going to be one of those that just thinks that God's word is without power. We're going to easily be deceived. And we'll think that God will not perform his word in our life. As far as from a knowledge standpoint, in Hosea chapter 4, in verse 6, it even tells us, <clears throat> My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. We've got to get the knowledge of God. That's why you being in the Word in all these areas is so important. In this case, it's because they have rejected knowledge. He said, I'll reject thee. God rejects those that have rejected knowledge. That's why you've got to get the Word in you. In Isaiah, in chapter 5, what happens if you don't have any knowledge? Verse 13 says, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. Why are they gone into captivity? Because they have no knowledge. You see, you just walk in your own ways. The devil will be easy to be able to bring you into captivity, bring you into bondage. You'll walk in the ways of sin, and he'll take you captive. That's why we've got to have the exact, precise, correct knowledge of God, and therefore walk in it and do it so that we will not go into captivity in our life. And regarding the power of God, we see over in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, in verse 5, the Bible, in fact, we even read verse 1 on it. It goes on, it says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. They're going to come. They haven't come yet. You know, wars on the horizon out there. Perilous times are going to come to the entire world. We know that's going to happen in the end. Men will be lovers of their own selves, <clears throat> covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means without self-control, fierce, otherwise they just do whatever they want to do, just do it, you know. Despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, what shouts for everybody? Come here, get pleased. Come here and have fun. Come here and do this great thing. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. This is even talking about people that are supposedly godly. They have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. From such turn away. We must understand all those, all those qualities show exactly the way society is today. We certainly are in the latter times. And those that even have a form of godliness, if they deny the power of God and do not walk in line with the word of God, see the power of God at work, then those are ones that you want to turn away from. We see also over in, Col in Colossians chapter 2, other reasons how a person can easily be deceived. We see in verse 8, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, deceitfulness being deceived. After the tradition of men, one of the ways that they do it is after the tradition of men, or after the rudiments, the ways of this world, all the things of the world, and not after Christ. 
You've got to guard yourself against the things of the world, and you've got to guard yourself against the traditions of men. They will deceive you and lead you away. How are we going to know what's, what's, the, what's the tradition of men and what's not? You're going to have to find out what the Word says and check it out in the Word. That's why we've got to know the Scriptures. We've got to follow. People will be spoiled if they don't follow after the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. We even see in Mark chapter 7, in verse 9, Jesus said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Instead of following God's commandments, people just do things the way they want to. We believe such and such a way. This is the way I believe. This is our tradition. That's what a lot of religious organizations say out there. That's totally, you, get, you hear that, you know, get away from that for sure. Keep their own tradition. <clears throat> we see down in verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. If we walk in the traditions of men, we make the word of God of none effect. It's not working in our life, which you've delivered with many such like things you do you. And that's what we see in a lot of groups out there today. The power of God's not working. God's not bringing forth change in their life. No fruit in their life. No healing, no deliverance, no victory. Why? Because the word of God is none effect because of their traditions. And the traditions have compromised the word of God and turned away from it. Also, we talked about the rudiments of this world, worldly principles. You and I must turn away from the things of this world. <clears throat> verse John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, not some, all of it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. It's evil. You don't want to be involved in it whatsoever. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's what you and I are to be. Those who do consistently the will of God. We talk about being a doer consistently, present tense, continuous, repeated action of doing the will of God. Those are the ones that are going to abide forever. You've got to understand, as it says in 1 John 5, verse 19, we know that we're of God, but the whole world lies in wickedness or in it's lying in evil, all kinds of evils of the enemy. So the whole world is under the dominion of Satan. Why? Because he's the God of this world. He's the one who works and orchestrates all the things that are going out on in there in the world system. We must turn around, away from it. We cannot be walking after the fads, the fashions of the world. Don't be one of those that follows whatever the worldly fashions go along and this, to be in style and all these kind of things. You don't want to have anything to do with that whatsoever. That is all the ways of the world. And we know from James chapter 4, in verse 4, <clears throat> he says this, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses, that's quite a statement. Who are the adulterers and adulteresses? Those that have friendship of the world. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, being deceived by the things of this world. We cannot walk after those ways whatsoever. Another thing that we see that brings to deception, and this is a major area that brings deception in the body of Christ, is in 1 John 4, 6, where we are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And we especially see the mixing of truth and error, which is a major problem that we see in the body of Christ. You know, many people out there in church circles, they believe that you're just saved just by belonging to the church. Belonging to some church, sign the, you know, on the dotted line and join such and such a church. Or... Just be baptized, you know, whatever all. Is that going to get you right into, into relationship with God? No way. John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. You've got to receive him as personal Lord and Savior. Not just, quote, believe and be baptized or these kind of things, but no, we must receive him and we must experience a new birth. Many groups never even talk about new birth. I didn't hear anything about being born again until I was 22 years old. Never heard anything 
about it. And I was in church groups, never heard a thing. Jesus said, marvel not, I said unto you, you must. This means it's absolutely necessary, is what this word means, a strong word. You must be born again, which means born from above. Well, if you never heard about it, you don't know anything about it. We've got to preach the truth to people. When you go and witness to people, don't just say, well, are you a Christian? Uh, most, a lot of people think they're a Christian out there. What you need to find out is, oh, have you been born again? And then a lot of times, what will they say? Well, I've been baptized, or I belong to the church. That's their answer. Well, that isn't the answer that shows the fact that they're born again. You say, praise God that you've been baptized and you've been, you belong to the church. But Jesus said, you must be born again. Have you received him as your personal Lord and Savior and been born again and changed on the inside of you? You've got to press the point to find out whether they've really received him or not. See, traditions of men have deceived the people and they think that they're okay. I was baptized. I was belonged to the church. Didn't, wasn't born again whatsoever. Walking in the ways of the world. Thought I was a Christian until I finally found out about being born again and having to receive him as my personal Lord and Savior. When you go to witness to people, be sure you drive that point home and find out if they receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Don't just believe that everything's fine just because they say they're a Christian or they go to church or whatever. You know, you say, hey, do you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. Oh, great, you must be a Christian. Well, who knows what kind of church they go to? You gotta find out whether it's the truth or not, what's the one that's really walking right. Another deceptive area is the area about the Holy Spirit. People have made the assumption that, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I'm born again. Most all, all the Christians believe that out there. But the Bible says that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is after we're born again. Luke 11, 13 says, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Our Heavenly Father is to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. Notice what it doesn't say. How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? It doesn't say that. It says the Heavenly Father. What's that mean? The person doing the asking ha approaches God as His Heavenly Father, which means what? He's already a son or a daughter of God. He's already born again. What's that tell you? You didn't get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. You get the Holy Spirit after you're born again because you ask the, whole, the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. We also know from Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You got born again. In whom also after you believed, not at the time you believed or at the point of belief, but after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That happened afterwards. And notice it calls the Holy Spirit one of the promises. Who has a right to the promises of God? Someone who's born again, not a person who's not born again. You have to be born again to have a right. And it goes on and says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Who has a right to inheritance? Only born again believers. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, which is one of the promises and the earnest of our inheritance, is only for those who are born again. Therefore, we receive the Holy Spirit after we're born again. We also know clearly from Acts chapter 8. And people try to make little excuses. Well, that was just an exception. You know, God must have just decided to make an exception. Hey, if it's a change and it's not in line with what you believe, it's not just an exception. <clears throat> that means your doctrine is out of line. In Acts chapter five, 8, uh, verse 5, Philip went to the city of Samaria, preached Christ unto them. What did they do? They with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. They got born again. They saw the miracles that he did. What happened then? It says they believed, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus. In verse 12, they were baptized, both men and women. That meant they were born again. Did they have the Holy Spirit yet? Well, they just assumed they did. Verse 14 says, When the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, why would they be doing that if they already had it? Because they didn't have it yet. For he was yet fallen upon none of them. That makes it pretty clear. The Holy Spirit was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That's clear as a bell. Philip's ministry at one point in time, they got born again. A total different point in time with other people ministering, the Holy Spirit then is received. Again, we see the false teaching that's out there. Then there's another group out there that believe, well, you just need to tarry for the Holy Spirit, you know. And so we're going to tarry continually until we receive the Holy Spirit. There's, those groups are out there today. 
They say, well, the Bible says you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until the dude with power from on high about the promise of the Father coming. Well, that's right. They had to do that at that point in time. That was then. What were they to tarry? Tarry to receive the Holy Spirit? No, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until he was poured out. They were supposed to wait for where he was going to be poured out. Well, did that happen? It sure did. Do we need to tarry any longer? No. All we need to do is receive the Holy Spirit. All those people that are tearing, they're deceived. What they've done, they've mixed some truth with some error. And so you have all these kinds of problems. We see another area where people have mixed truth with error is in the area about speaking in tongues. Many people think that it's passed away and think it's not for today. They might take a scripture such as 1 Corinthians 13, 8, and it says, well, the Bible says, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Tongues have ceased. They're not for today anymore. They've passed away. They were just to authenticate the apostles, you know. Well, is that the truth? Well, when you take something like this, we also got to look at the whole verse. Have prophecies failed? No. There's still ones that need to come to pass. Has knowledge vanished away? No. Knowledge has not vanished away. So if these two things haven't done, then how in the world could this be done? Tongues have not ceased. You can't take something and pull it out of Scripture and make a doctrine out of it. But that's what people have done, unfortunately. We see major problems in the body of Christ <clears throat> because they have tried to twist things to believe what they want to believe. We also see among people that say, well, tongues is like just a gift. Most Christians, whether they're fundamentalists or full gospel or whatever, think that tongues is a gift. They think it's just one of the gifts of the Spirit that God gives to you if he decides to give it to you. And the excuse that many people say why they don't speak in tongues is because I didn't get that gift. They sincerely believe that. But they failed to understand that there's a difference between the prayer language of tongues and the gift of tongues. They're two different things. You've got to explain that to people. Here it says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. That's praying. And what is praying with the Spirit? <clears throat> If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. It's a prayer language, isn't it? And notice, what does it say? This is written to every Christian, isn't it? I will pray. That means you can do it at your will. That means every single Christian who has the Holy Spirit can pray in tongues at will. It must not be some gift that's just for certain people and not for others. It must be available for all of us. It is. Every one of us can pray in tongues. In fact, we're told and directed to pray with our spirit as well as pray with our understanding. Therefore, God expects all of us to be able to pray in tongues. Is it a gift of tongues? No. It is a prayer language. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can pray in tongues at will. What are we doing? He that speaketh an unknown tongue, in verse 2, he speaks not unto men, but unto God. When you're speaking in tongues, what are you doing? You're speaking from the Holy Spirit within you in a prayer language that's speaking unto God, not unto men. No man understands them. That's right. You're not going to understand. Howbeit in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. You're speaking in the Spirit things that you don't know. Mysteries or things that are hidden. Things that you don't understand. Also, when you're speaking in tongues, he that speaks an unknown tongue edifies himself. It has a dual effect. You're speaking unto God, and it's also edifying and building up you. And this is something that God wants us to do continually. Because Paul even says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. He was putting it into operation. That shows the fact that he wants us all to speak in tongues and to put our prayer language in operation. Well, is it, is it a gift? Well, it, there is a gift of tongues. That's true. And people come over quickly over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, talk about the manifestation of the Spirit given to every man to profit with all. And it speaks of the nine gifts of the Spirit here. And in the midst of these nine gifts of the Spirit, one of them is called the diverse kinds of tongues. Notice also there's the interpretation of tongues. These nine gifts of the Spirit, three of them reveal something, three do something, and three speak. They're vocal. And this particular one here about tongues, one of the ones that speak, also the interpretation is bringing what is being said forth and what's the purpose of the nine gifts of the Spirit. The nine gifts of the Spirit's purpose is the manifestation of the Spirit given to every man to profit with all, to profit with others. And it's to manifest through us to minister to others. So therefore, what's the effect of the gifts of the Spirit? It's to man, isn't it? But what's, what, do we, what do we just read about when we pray in tongues? It goes up to God, or it's edifying you. 
Do the gifts of the Spirit, are they for you? No. They're for you to minister to others. Are the gifts of the Spirit something you're ministering unto God? In, 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 any of those? No. Instead, God's coming through us to minister to people. So there's a difference, isn't there? The gift of tongues operates by the, the Father operating through, he, the Father and Son and Holy Spirit are involved in it, operating through us to bring a message through the interpretation of it to the church. It's not something that's for ourselves, nor is it something that we send up to God. While praying in tongues is something that we can all do at will, and we pray unto God, a perfect prayer, as well for things that we don't know what all to pray for, as well as bringing edification and, and a, a strengthening and a, a building up of ourself. That shows you the difference. Not everybody has the gift of tongues. Everybody has certain gifts that are given. But everybody has the prayer language of tongues once you have the Holy Spirit within you. You've got to be able to explain that to people. So people are not deceived by all of these things. And this is so important. We also pointed out, and we discussed this before, the fact that many people think that, well, I'm supposed to follow the, old, the ways of the, all the commandments of the Old Testament. I'm supposed to follow off to the, new, the, the, the commandments of God. That's right, we are to obey the commandments of God. In fact, if, even if we look at a scripture over in John chapter 14, we see in verse 15, what does he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Whose commandments? The commandments that Jesus has given to us. What are we under in the New Testament? Are we under all the commandments of the Word of God that are there from the Old Testament and in the New Testament? No. We're under the New Testament commandments, which is the law of Christ. We even see it referred to in Galatians chapter 6, in verse 2, where it talks about bearing one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. We're now under the law of Christ that we operate by. Now, are we under the Old Testament? No. <clears throat> We're not under the laws of the Old Testament any longer. Hebrews 7.12, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of, of necessity a change of the law. Not a continuation or an add-on to the law. A change. That means it's not the same thing anymore, is it? A change of the law. And the question is, people say, is, well, I'm, I thought I was supposed to obey the Old Testament commandments and the New Testament commandments. It sounds like it's the right thing to do, but it's not so. In fact, let's just give you an example. Here's an Old Testament commandment. And let's say you're, you're up there before God and, you know, you're at judgment day and he's saying, well, did you do, do my, keep my commandments? And Jesus is speaking to you and you say, oh, sure, I sure did. I kept this commandment right here in Psalms 139, 22. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. I hate them. The Bible says so. Well, Jesus is going to say to you, well, wait a minute. That's the Old Testament. You're not you're under the Old Testament any longer, are you? No, I'm under the New Testament. Well, what's the New Testament tell you? Matthew 5, 44 says, love your enemies. Are you supposed to hate your enemies? No. Well, I thought I was doing the Word of God. I was doing the Old Testament. No. That means you can't, if you do the Old Testament, it's going to be contradictory to the New Testament in areas. Therefore, do we do the Old Testament commandments? No. Let's give another example. Psalms 109. And there's people out there that minister deliverance that are out there on the websites that even tell people to do this. And there's people that do this even in circles, uh, deliverance circles today, which is total error. They tell you to return curses back to the person. That's totally wrong. You don't send curses back. Well, well that's in the Bible. It's one of the Old Testament words. Psalms 109, verse 17. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. He delighteth not in blessings, let it be far from him. No blessings for that guy. Is that the thing we should do? No. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with garments, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. I mean, you know, you're, are you pronouncing good things? No, you're pronouncing curses. Let mine adversaries be clothed with shame. Let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. You tell that before Jesus, well, I was praying all those things and, and speaking those things into being to spring those curses upon him. What does the Bible say? He's going to sit there and say, uh, you're under the wrong covenant. You're supposed to be keeping the new covenant commandments, which said what? Bless those that curse you. See, we don't do the things of the Old Testament any longer. We do the things of the New Testament. <coughs> we also see another one. Exodus 
chapter 21, where we see in the midst of the commandments, they're talking about eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. I'm going to pay them back. I'm going to get them. I'm going to retaliate against the guy. <coughs> Is that what God would have us to do? No way. These are just prime examples of the fact that we don't do the Old Testament commandments. Because remember, if you do one, you've got to do them all. If you don't do them all, you're going to be guilty. Matthew 5.44 tells us what? Does it tell us to repay? No, it says, do good to those that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So, are we going to give an eye not for an eye, tooth for tooth? No way. We're not going to do those kind of things. Jesus even said, you, you, you heard this, love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. He even quotes it, referring back there. No. Therefore, if you're keeping the Old Testament commandments, then you're making a mistake. The only way you follow the Old Testament commandments is only in the light of the New Testament reality with New Testament application. So it's nothing wrong looking at the commandments as long as you look at them in the New Testament light. And there's many in the Old Testament which carry over into the New Testament as far as they're right in line with those. Walking right, being holy, all kinds of different ones. So we want to be sure that we are not being deceived. Now you say, why is this important? We've got a whole group of people that are following a, the, what they call the messianic type of teaching out there, that thinks I'm supposed to be Torah observant, go back and keep all the Old Testament, th and be reading all these things, and keeping all the Old Testament commandments, and observing all these Old Testament ways and so forth, the feast of the Lord, all these things, in a physical sense, keeping this physical Sabbath and all that. No, we aren't under that anymore. We're now, everything is of the Spirit. And now we're entering into a spiritual Sabbath. And now we are bringing forth the revelation of what Jesus did in fulfillment of the first four feasts and of what he's about to do when he comes back again in the fulfillment of the final three feasts. That's what we teach, to teach the reality of what Jesus is doing. Therefore, we got a whole group of people that are deceived out there that are thinking that they're supposed to do that. We also see people, that, there's even people out there that won't even say the name of Jesus because they're convinced that it's the name of Yeshua. That's what it is in the Old Testament. And they ref almost refuse to even say the name of Jesus. Well, does the Holy Spirit know all the languages? He sure does. What was the New Testament written in? Greek, but there also were Hebrew words in the Old Testament, or in the, the, from the Old Testament that are in the New Testament. Well, if Jesus' name was supposed to be, quote, Yeshua, wouldn't the Holy Spirit have always written it to be in the Hebrew when he put it forth in the New Testament? Sure he would have. Did he do that? Never in the New Testament. It's said it's Iesus, which is the name for, in the Greek, meaning Jesus. What's that mean? The name of Jesus, which is our transliteration word in English, is fine. What's the name? It's the name in whatever language that you speak. Do we speak Hebrew? No then why are we speaking a Hebrew name or thinking that that is, quote, the, the certain divine name or uh, sacred name teaching? This is in the body of Christ today. Can you see the deception that's coming? And there's a whole lot of people that are out there doing that. You've got to be wise and not let the enemy deceive you from these kinds of things. We see lots of people that are going back into this. This is all spirits of deception that are coming in these people. We've got to turn away from that. Deception. How else can the enemy work? We see in Romans chapter 3, over here in verse 13. It says, Their throats an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. With your tongue. We talked about our words, how our words are so important. We've got to be sure that we're only speaking right words. Because your mouth is a releaser, remember? Words are carriers, and they release things. There's power within them of whatever you're speaking. And what's it say in James 1.26? If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, that means you can deceive your own heart. How could I deceive my own heart? When you speak, what happens? Words are heard within you, and they get into you. Just like when you hear the word, the word gets into your heart, doesn't it? When you're speaking words, what happened? It's also coming into your heart. You're actually influencing your heart by what you speak. If you don't bridle your tongue, you will deceive your own heart. That's why we've got to watch the words that we speak. 
Only speak words that are in line with God's word. Speak words that are going to be the truth. Don't speak doubt. Don't speak unbelief. Don't speak, you know, I'm never going to make it. Hopeless, I'm discouraged, down, depressed, all these negative things. You know, how's that going to release God for you? How's that going to change things? Now, you need to speak what God says and start doing what he says and not let yourself be speaking words that are contrary or you will deceive your own self. We also see in James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That means if we hear something, but we don't do it, we deceive ourselves because we will not see it come to pass in our life. We must do the word that we hear, not just be a hearer only. Just, you know, have all this knowledge, but not act upon it. It's not going to produce any results. You hear the word, it produces faith, but faith without works of doing the word and working the word, it's dead, it's alone, doesn't produce anything whatsoever. And then we're deceived. We haven't seen the production of the word of God in our life. That's why we've got to be doers of God's word. Over in Hebrews, in chapter 3, verse 10, we see something else about deception. He says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, they do always err or are deceived in their heart and they have not known my ways. If we are deceived in our heart, we will not know the ways of the Lord. How can we get deceived in our heart? Many ways, by hearing the wrong thing, thinking wrong things, because your, your heart is the result of all the production of all the things that come into you, what you're thinking upon, what you're hearing, what you're speaking, all these things you're allowing coming in. That's why you don't want to hear all this garbage out there in the world, the TV and all the things that are coming forth. You only want to hear the things of God. You want to hear the word sown in you. You want God's word and you want to watch the words you speak. So the production of your heart is always the things of God and not anything that's contrary to the word. That's also why you don't want to be hearing people speaking a bunch of doubt and unbelief and things that are contrary to the word. It's getting sown in your heart. Then you've got to deal with that. You know, you've got to be guarding yourself. You only want to hear the truth. And of course, what's the result? You'll never know the ways of the Lord if you err or are deceived in your heart. He goes on and says, so I swear in my wrath they'll not enter into my rest. They don't get to enter into the rest. They don't get to enter into the promises of God and fulfill the, what the spiritual Sabbath is all about, which is the entering into the rest of God as we possess all the promises of God in our life. He says, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And then he says, exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This tells you another thing. Sin is deceitful. Sin will deceive you, and it will cause a hardening in your heart. All these people out there that say, well, we know we're always going to sin, so don't think that you can get victory over all sin in your life. That's a lie. Don't listen to that stuff. You hear those kind of teachings? Get away from them. Are they in line with the Word? No. What is sin doing? Is sin a big deal? say, well, I'll just, if I sin, I can always confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me, and everything will be fine. Well, it's true that you can confess your sins, but you know what? It is still affecting you in your heart and is causing a hardening of heart, plus spirits that have come in from sin are coming into you, you know? I mean, you can't go out there and do the bad, evil thing, run and confess your sin, and think that everything's fine. You don't have any evil effect of it. That's like the person who goes out, commits fornication, runs into the Lord, confesses their sin, and thinks they have no effect of it. Yeah, they get spirits that come into them. They might have sexually transmitted diseases. Who knows what? Your confession of sin, you know, that gets you free of your problem? No, especially if you go back into it continually. You get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, and then it, what? it's easier to commit the sin easier the next time and the next time. It's easier to lie. It's easier to cheat a little bit. Easier to go take another drink. Easier to maybe, you know, yield to some of these things, evil things. No. We cannot allow sin in our life. Sin is deceitful, and it will cause a hardening in your life. And of course, you're not going to know the ways of the Lord, and you won't enter into the rest, which is the promises of God being manifest in your life. Another thing that's important, we always have to be correctable. Proverbs chapter 10. Pride doesn't want to be corrected. Proverbs 10, 17 says, He is in the way of life that keeps instruction or the discipline, the chasing, the correction of the Lord. But he that refuses the reproof, or this correction and rebuke, he errs. This is the word for erring, wandering, going astray, or being deceived in the Old Testament. <coughs> if you refuse correction, what happens? We get deceived. 
We just continue in our own sinful ways. It's where sometimes you tell someone, well, you need to be doing this instead of this. You need to change and repent from this. And they don't want to hear it. And so they just, you know, go off in their own ways. And what happens? They're going to be deceived. They are erring. The enemy is leading them away because they refuse reproof. We've got to always be correctable, always be ready to change, always be ready to deal with things in our life. We see another thing. Pride, this just goes right along with what we just mentioned, but pride is a big deceiver. In Psalms 119, what caused the devil to fall? His pride, wasn't it? In Psalms 119, verse 21, thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed. The proud are cursed. What's, what's, what about them? Which do err from thy commandments. <coughs> they're deceived and they're erring. They're turned away from doing the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, we have pride. We're going to be cursed. We're going to err from the commandments of God. And what has happened? We have been deceived. That's why you've got to deal with any attitudes of pride in your life. We see in Obadiah, verse 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. It is deceiving to us. We cannot allow ourselves to have pride. You must maintain humility at all times in life. Pride will deceive you because you think you've arrived. You think you know it. You know, the know-it-all spirit, you know. I can do it myself kind of thing, you know. All these kind of things. It always comes back to self-something. No, we're, we're, I can, we're not going to have that. We're going to get rid of pride. We're going to be humble. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We also see a scripture over in Proverbs. Chapter 12, in verse 20, how the enemy tries to deceive. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. We can't be imagining or devising evil. Anybody that's plotting evil or imagining evil, this would include jumping to conclusions about people or making, you know, that you have no found foundation for whatsoever. You've got to watch. Don't start making, uh, jumping to conclusions about people, about their intentions, about things that you don't even know what you're talking about. We've got, if you aren't judging it by the Spirit, then you're way off base. We cannot be jumping to conclusions or imagining evil or any of these kinds of things or devising any kind of evil. Any evil thoughts that come into your mind as we talked about, what do you do? You cast that down immediately. You bring that into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You don't let those evil thoughts be in you for a moment. Retaliation, getting back at something, holding unforgiveness, resentful, bitter, angry at them, whatever. That's all evil. There's no justification for that whatsoever. God wants us to get rid of all these things in our life. We also see in Proverbs 26, over here in verse 24, He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. Hatred. We're deceiving ourselves. Can we ever have hatred? Never. In fact, if you ever let hatred get a hold of you, I don't care what a person's done to you. They may have done a very evil thing to you, but what must you do? You must always forgive. Whosoever, 1 John 3, 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. See, God looks from the heart. If you have a hatred towards that person, you hate them, you, you're a murderer in God's sight. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In fact, he's finished. If he doesn't repent of that for the end of his days, he's got to get things in order. No justification for having negative attitudes against anybody. I don't care what they've done or circumstances or whatever. Do not let it get a hold of you. Isaiah 3.12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead, shall lead, which lead thee, cause thee to err or to be deceived and destroy the way of thy paths. This is talking about a house out of divine order. God set the husband to be the head in the home. He's supposed to be the leader. He's the one that's supposed to be directing things the way, where things are to go in line with the word of God. That's why if you, you don't want to have a man that's not going to be the head and in line with the word of God, that's going to put the word of God first place and leading in way of the word of God. Oh, you've got problems. That's why all men, all you men, you've got to get the word of God first place. You've got to be one who gets the word and knows it and uh, example for your family and leading your family in the way of the word of God. Don't let someone else be ruling, you know. A lot of people let the children have control and do whatever they want to do. No, you've got to restrain them or let the, the, woman, the, children, you know, the, the wife or somebody have control. No, she's the partner by your side, but God made the man the head. 
who is supposed to be directing the way that things are to go. Unfortunately, a lot of times women have to make somewhat of a lead because the husbands haven't taken their rightful place, which is a problem. Well, they have to go forth and do the things of the Word of God and put the Word of God first place, and that's right. They're not out of order. They're doing what's right. But men, we need to come in line and be doing what the Word says to lead in the right path. 1 John 1, 1.8, here's another way of, deception, way of deception. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There's false grace teaching out there that says, well, that Jesus, he forgave our sins, all of the ones of the past, the present, and the future that I have committed or might commit. All, I, all my sins are taken care of, so I don't need to deal with my sin anymore. That's a lie. You need to confess your sins. When you commit sin, you need to confess them. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteous. If we think we don't have any sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We conquer the sin. At the same time, when we have sin, we have to confess it and turn from it in our life. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. These people think that they don't sin anymore. We don't sin anymore. We don't need to confess our sins anymore. It's already been done. Jesus already took care of it. Lies. There's groups out there in the Christian world that teach those kind of things. Do not listen to these lies. Again, you can see how the deception works. People have not understood the truth. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. We should never think highly of ourselves, more highly than we ought. We should never exalt ourselves in any way. That's the problem we see. We see it in the entire ministry. Because all the ministry wants to tout their titles, which is the Nicolaitan spirit that God hates, and the deeds of the Nicolaitans with a con conquering spirit over the people. Nikolai means conquer. Laity means people. The Nicolaitan spirit that he hated is the conquer the people spirit, which is exalting the, quote, clergy over the people. That is an abomination. Nobody ever in the Bible was ever addressed by their title first and then their name. Pastor so-and-so, apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, you know, whatever it might be. Nobody. Well, how were they addressed? by their name. And then it might identify what their particular ministry was after that. What do we see in the world today? Everybody's got their title. And I want you to call me by my title. And I'm always going to introduce myself as my title. That's why people say, what do you want me to call you? Dave. That's my name. You know. Well, I thought you were supposed to call me pastor. No. My name's Dave. You want to call me that? It's up to you. But I'm introducing myself as Dave. That's who I am. I'm not going to be playing that title game because I'm going to keep a humility and I'm not going to get the Nicolaitan spirit on me, that's for sure. We don't want that kind of stuff. But it's in the body of Christ. It's out there, everybody. Some churches, everybody's got a title of something. You know, you got some title, we've got to give you something, you know, we'll, we'll make you uh, something, such and such. Minister, even we'll call you minister something, something. You know, some people, you know, when uh, you want, I want you to call me bishop so-and-so. They'll even answer that, I'm bishop so-and-so. This is all out of line. This is a Nicolaitan spirit in the church. It's abomination. It's them exalting themselves. I am something special. That's a lie. All I am, myself, and all people that are in any area fall full-time ministry, I, have a minister, I am a believer just like you. I just happen to have a ministry gift given to me that I'm responsible to carry out. I'm no different. We're not, quote, above so-and-so. That's a lie. But that's what we see in the body of Christ today. In fact, that's why a lot of them aren't even approachable. They won't let anybody talk to them. I am the guy who knows everything, you know. It's a big lie. You can't even talk to them. They won't even listen to you. They just throw you out or whatever all. That's, an, that's a Nicolaitan spirit in these people. They're not even teachable or approachable. If a man thinks himself to be something, he's nothing. He deceiveth himself. We got a whole group of ministry out there in the body of Christ. They're all deceived and they all are puffed up. And we got major problems. They all need to come to the place of repentance. That's why you don't, you know, I refuse to call these people this. You know, the Bible even says, you don't call anybody father. I'll never address anybody as father so-and-so. Never. I don't care who they are. You don't call anybody rabbi. I'll never address anybody as, quote, rabbi. Because the Bible says so. I don't care what they are. I'll call them by their first name, or I'll just call them, you know, I won't call them anything. But I'm not about to address them 
So, well, isn't that being respectful to them? It's contrary to the word of God. You're not being respectful to God. You're being respectful to man and the deceitfulness of the devil. Don't ever do that. Don't let the devil deceive you. We've got to follow what is the truth. Keep that right spirit at all times. 1 Timothy 2.14 Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Now, what was it about her being deceived? She followed her senses. She saw that it was good for food. And to make one wise, thought, oh, this is going to be good for me. She started leaning to her own senses and reasoning in her mind, didn't she? And that was a mistake back in Genesis. Not only did she not know the word of God, you can't touch it, but now she thought, oh, it looks good, you know. We'll even show you these scriptures. We didn't go to it before, but talking about Eve back here. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, where we see, she said, uh, through the tree in the garden, God said, we should not eat of it, neither shall touch it. He never said not touch it. It's not recorded in the word of God whatsoever. She didn't have things straight. And of course, he says, hey, you're going to open your eyes. You'll be, knowing, you'll be as God's, knowing good and evil. The woman saw, senses, that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes. Oh, this looks good. Moved by her senses instead of moved by the word of God. Tree desired to make one wise, reasoning, ah, I'm going to get wiser. I'm going to have some wisdom now. Instead of God, who's the source, of course, took the fruit and made the mistake. She followed the senses, she did her own reasoning, and she was deceived. You cannot follow your senses, which is your feelings. It doesn't matter what you feel. I don't feel led to uh, pray today. I think I'm just going to do something else. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to be praying without ceasing. You need to be praying. I don't feel led to witness to so-and-so. Since when do you have to, quote, feel led to do something? The Bible already told you to do it. You're going by your feelings. They're deceiving us, aren't they? Away from the truth. We cannot allow ourselves to follow. Or reasoning in our mind. No, that's deception from the enemy. Another thing that we see as a problem is we must deal with the flesh. <clears throat> we see over in, in, down here in Titus. Titus chapter 3, how the enemy will try to deceive us. Titus 3, verse 3. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. That's right. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures. We don't want to serve lusts and pleasures. We're going to deny ourselves instead. Living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. That's all the works of deception of what the enemy wants to do. That's why, what's the answer of what we have to do? God tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, over here in verse 22. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. All the desires that come from the body are deceitful as far as to get, do things contrary to the word of God we're talking about. They're deceitful. They're corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You are to put all those off and you are not to give place to them whatsoever. We also are to deal with all sin because remember what happens if you have sin. It causes spots and blemishes in you, doesn't it? Well, it talks about in 2 Peter 2.13, they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. There's a reward for righteousness, but there's also a reward for unrighteousness. As they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. That's why, can you allow people with spots and blemishes that don't want to deal with their sin and want to, you know, go on with their own deceivings to be feasting with you? No. You're not going to have fellowship with them. You're going to call them to repentance and they've got to deal with these problems or else you're not going to be in fellowship with them. Also, we see the people that are coveting money. Does God want to prosper us? Yes. Does he want us to covet money? No. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred or been deceived from the faith. These guys are all, all they're, they're thinking about is money, 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 money. They're deceived. They're coveting after this. That's their whole focus. You want to follow God, follow God, and God will prosper the work of your hands, and he wants to bring blessings. <coughs> the love of money is the root of all evil, and we cannot be coveting after these kinds of things. We see that that's one of the things that will even choke the word out of you. In Mark chapter 4, we see over in verse 19, what's he say? He says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. I want, I want all these things. And the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. They'll deceive you. It's the deceitfulness of riches. You see, 
You don't want to have that. Sure, God, you need these things. But God wants you to be following him. You want the riches of Christ, not the riches of this world. And the things that God brings to you is so that you can have it to propagate the gospel, not so you can get more and more and more, better and bigger houses and all these kind of things just for me. You know, have all my money and money, those tons of money. Well, sure, you need money so you have ability to be able to take care of yourself. God wants you to be blessed. He gives us all things richly to enjoy, as the Bible says. But he doesn't want us to be those that are deceived by riches, thinking that they're going to give me pleasure and all these kind of things. No. We need to be using our finances to, for the gospel, praise God. We also got to deal with all the works of the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not the unrighteousness shall not, unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Why would he say that? Because people are being deceived. You know, some, a lot of pastors out there, they think that fornicators, adulterers, as long as they're born again, they're going to go to heaven, they're okay. Sorry, it's not so. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abuse themselves with mankind, which are the homosexuals, the thieves, the covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, the extortioners, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. No, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's why we cannot allow, these are all evil things, works of the flesh. They've got to be dealt with in our life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. <clears throat> the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, unbridled lust. No, you can't let that get a hold of you. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, which is strife, contention, being contentious. Emulations, wrath, strife. This is kind of trying to, to have a fractious spirit to try to get what you want, to kind of get your way, kind of. Seditions, division, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings the party spirit, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, they which do such things shall in not inherit the kingdom of God. They're not making it. That shows you the fact that we have to deal with all of the works of the flesh. Another thing that will bring deception, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, all these ones that think that I can just get born again and just go and live my life and do whatever I want, the old one saved, always save crowd te type teaching, that thinks I can do anything I want, it's deception. It's a lie from the enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Again, why does God tell us that? Because people are being deceived about this. Evil communications, or this means communion and companionship, corrupts good manners. Can you be around somebody and have fellowship with, companionship, communion with someone that is not walking right? No, it's going to corrupt you. It will corrupt you. You need to separate yourself and not allow yourself to be corrupted by the evil. It will corrupt good manners. It will have an effect upon you. So that's another way that we can be deceived. We also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, quite a statement. Let no man deceive himself. If any among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So he can't be deceived. It talks about, back here, about if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God's holy, which temple you are, let no man deceive himself, is what this is talking about. <clears throat> we can't be destroying ourselves, or God's going to destroy us. We're to live unto him. We, our bodies are not our own. They belong to him. We must live unto the Lord. So we can't be allowing, doing anything to defile the temple in any way. We see another scripture over in James. <clears throat> One. 16. Do not err, my beloved brother. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And he's, he's just, after he talks about how lust conceives, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Don't think that sin isn't going to have a negative effect. Don't be deceived. It is going to bring death upon a person. That's why we've got to deal with the lusts. We cannot yield to the areas of sin. It doesn't matter what area it is. God wants us to deal with all of these areas in our life. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Anything that causes you to lust after things that are not of God, you've got to get rid of it. 2 Thessalonians 2.10. It speaks here, and this is in the context here, of talking about the Antichrist who's going to come on the scene with the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. That tells you something. 
unrighteous things deceive you. Righteous things, of course, lead you towards God. That's why we've got to do the word of righteousness. Anything that's contrary to the word is deceiving you. It's unrighteousness. All deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish. And that's what the Antichrist will be proclaiming the fact that it's okay to do unrighteousness. It's fine. It's not a problem. Just do whatever you want. It's a lie. And so what's going to happen? The deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish, they didn't receive the love of the truth, the word, that they might be saved. So they're going to be in big time trouble, of course. We also see over in Romans, chapter 16, deception. It's got to be dealt with. You cannot let yourself be deceived. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you've learned. Are you supposed to be around people that are teaching you false doctrine? No. You're supposed to mark those that are causing that, contrary to the doctrine you've learned, and avoid them. Get away from them. You don't put up with them. It says get away from them. For they uh, such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. By good words, fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You don't want it. They're deceiving people in some capacity. They've got their own agenda. If they had the agenda of the Lord, they'd be following the true doctrine of the Lord. People that do not, that cause division or offenses contrary to the doctrine... These kind of people, avoid them. Do not put up with them. Get away from them. We also see over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Where henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. That's why you can't be listening to all these things. You've got to get set settled. By the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. People being deceived again but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. Therefore, God does not want you being carried about with all these different winds of doctrine in which you're being deceived. We must get things right through the Word of God, and we will as we study the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, Let no man deceive you, again, with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of, of, of disobedience. And what was he talking about? The thing for verse 5. No whoremonger, that's a fornicator. Or unclean person. Or covetous one who's one who's not cleansed. That's quite a statement. You've got to be cleansed. You're expected to be cleansed. You confess your sin, it'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're to cleanse yourself from all the filthiness of the flesh and all the of spirit by casting out the demons. That's why we want to be cleansed in all areas. Nor covetous man, nor idolater. Who, who's an idolater? The covetous guy is an idolater. He's made money his idol, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That tells you it could last for eternity. You know why? Because who's the one who has the kingdom during the millennial reign? Jesus does. What happens when he puts everything down and at the very end, what does he do? He gives the kingdom back to the Father. Remember? It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. So inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, referring to Jesus, the millennial reign, and of God, which is talking about God the Father, which talks about throughout eternity because it's going to be given back to him. That's why he says, don't let anybody deceive you. These things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We've got to stay away from all these things. That's why we've got to walk a holy walk. There's no other way. That's why it says, without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. 1 Samuel 28, <clears throat> verse 7. Here's seeking the woman with a familiar spirit. Woman had a familiar spirit. Can we follow after familiar spirits? Anything like this? People were doing these kind of things. We cannot be following after anything that's not in line with the Word of God. We've got to stay away from it. This, of course, he disguised himself. He got totally deceived. You can't be having anything to do with anything of the world that's kind of witchcraft oriented. It's amazing how Christians sometimes are dabbling in these kind of things, reading their horoscope, doing all these little things. Also, Proverbs 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wine and strong drink. Leviticus 10, 9 says, Don't drink wine or strong drink. He's commanded us. Whoever is deceived, you're deceived by it. We're not wise. That's why you totally eliminate all these things. One other scripture in Proverbs, Even food can deceive you. You've got to watch. He talks about here in Proverbs 23, verse 2. Consider what's before you. Put a knife to thy throat if thou be man given to appetite. Got a problem with gluttony and appetite? 
get that knife up there, buddy. You're not going to eat this stuff. You're only going to eat what you need. You're not going to be a glutton. Get that knife to that throat. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they're deceitful meat. What's deceitful? Deceitful meat means food. Do you know there's deceitful food? What is deceitful food? Looks good, smells good, tastes good, but it's no good. It's not ministering to your body. God wants us to put things that are filling our body. You want to put, would you go out and put a bunch of, you know, bad stuff into your gas tank of your car and think your car is going to run? No, you've got to put the right thing in there or you can mess it up real good. Our bodies, we want them to, you know, run the best. Put things in your body that are going to minister life to you. Praise God. Not these things that taste good. That's the devil. Food can be deceitful. Deceitful food. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, be, let no man deceive you. No man. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Of course, we've talked about this numerous times here. The fact that people think that I can just do anything, that I'm perfectly righteous when I'm born again, and everything's fine, I'm going to heaven regardless. Lies. You are not righteous unless you're doing righteousness continually. Remember the word doeth, present tense, continuous, repeated action. We're not righteous just because we're born again only. We're righteous because we not only are born again, but we're doing righteous continually. Then we'll be righteous. And what's going to be the result of that? Holiness. And God wants every one of us to be holy before the Lord. Remember, we must be holy. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Therefore, we're walking the walk. We're walking the way of the few. The few, the ones that enter into, they're walking the straight and narrow way that leads to, to life. But the broad way is the many are walking, which leads to destruction. That's why we can't be deceived. And we're certainly in the age, right now, in the last days, where there's so much false teaching out there, it makes you think you can just do anything you want. It is a lie. Don't listen to this stuff. This is the many. They're going to be in trouble. Instead, let's walk the straight and narrow way and not be deceived. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that warns me to not be deceived. I know the devil is the deceiver of mankind. And I see how he brings deception. I will not be deceived because I'm going to know the scriptures. I'm going to know the power of God. I will not follow the tradition of men or the worldly ways. I will not allow truth to be mixed with error. I will get the exact truth in the Word of God. I will watch my words. I will do the Word. I will not be deceived and be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, or I will not know His ways and enter into His rest. I will receive the correction of the Lord. I will be humble. I will not allow pride to get a hold of me. I will not imagine or devise any evil. I will not have hatred. I will not allow my house to be out of divine order. The Word of God is first place in it. And my house lines up with everybody in order, in line with the Word. I thank you that I do have sin that I deal with in my life. And I conquer and get free of it. I don't think that I haven't, haven't any sin or I'm a liar and been deceived. I won't think of myself more highly than I ought or think I'm something special. I won't follow the senses or be self-serving or reason in my mind. And I won't serve lusts and have spots and blemishes. I won't covet money. I won't allow the works of the flesh to have dominion in me, but I will crucify the flesh. I will not have company with people that are ungodly. I will not defile my temple. I will not reject the truth. I will not have any to do with people that cause division and strife. I will avoid them. I will not have false doctrine because I'm going to get the truth. And I understand People that walk on the flesh, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
I will not drink wine or strong drink and be deceived by it. And I'm going to deal with food. And I'm not going to partake of deceitful food. I'm going to put right things in my body to minister what it needs. I thank you, Lord. I will not be deceived. I will do righteousness. And then I will be righteous. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to be deceived in these last days by following after signs and wonders. I won't be one of those that will be deceived by the devil or by the Antichrist or any evil spirits. I will not follow doctrines of devils, but I will follow the truth. As I put the Word of God first place in my life and hear and do it, I will not, not be deceived, but I will be wise to the deceiving works of the enemy. I will walk in the truth, and I will walk in victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We got another part of this message will be tonight, which is about the results of deception. We've seen some of them, but there's a lot more about the results of deception and how they would work in a person's life. We'll be talking about that this evening in the evening service. Praise God. Any need prayer before we conclude? We want to invite you to come forward. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and dismiss. Encourage you to be a doer and don't let yourself be deceived. Do you have a question? Yes. First of all, uh, what scripture is